All right, we're starting, uh, not starting, we're continuing our uh, Doctrinal Drift series. And uh, if you're new uh, to our Wednesday night, welcome, by the way. Thanks for being here. Uh, we're uh, continuing this series. We've been doing it for a while. We're in week 11, uh, and we've got at least one more week to this, possibly more. I've got some ideas kind of rumbling around. We'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, and I may get your ideas uh, at the end tonight on some you know, future things we might uh, study. So um, kind of roll that around in your head uh, for the next however long this is going to be. Um, and just kind of think about some things maybe you'd like to learn or books of the Bible you'd like to study. And we'll talk about that uh, at the end tonight. Um, so we're in part 11 of Doctrinal Drift. And what we've been doing through this series is we've been taking popular things, uh, doctrines or beliefs um, that are popular in church today and we're going back in church history to see did the earliest Christians believe that or did they believe something different about a certain topic. So we've talked about all kinds of topics. But tonight, we're going to kind of deviate a little bit. We're not going to talk about a doctrine. We're uh, going to talk about this thing in your Bible called chapters and verses. Um, because <clears throat> everybody, unless you've got some kind of strange Bible, um, you have chapters and verses in your Bible, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, that wasn't always the case, so we're going to talk about that uh, tonight, and um, what we're going to really deal with is when did we start as Christians taking verses out of context and making them mean something they don't mean? Um, <clears throat> now, the tr truth be told, that has went on all of church history, okay, but it, it really increased at a certain point in history, and that's when you could find one verse at a time. Uh, it became easier to pull verses out of context when you can find them a lot faster. Uh, so that's kind of what we're going to talk about tonight. So it's not really a doctrine. Uh, it's more of how do we guard ourselves from taking verses out of context. So um, let me kind of give you an outline for tonight. We're going to do a little bit of history tonight. I know in the past sessions we kind of spent a long time uh, tracking some stuff through history. Uh, this will be really short because um, there were no chapters and verses in the Bible until a long time into, <laughs> into church history, so that'll be pretty short. Uh, then we'll talk about the downside of these uh, divisions in your Bible between chapters and verses. Um, there's a plus side to it, but there's also some, some dangers. Then I'm going to take some passages that um, you might really like, and I'm going to ruin them. And I enjoy that kind of thing, but uh, I would say sorry about that, but I'm really not sorry. We need to stop taking verses out of context. So uh, I'm going to take some pop. Uh, there's, we could spend weeks on this, but I'm just going to select a few of the most popular ones and just kind of show you how we read them out of context. And in that process, I want to teach you how to read the Bible in context. So uh, that's what we're going to talk about uh, at the end. So everybody good? Ready to learn? Okay, good deal. Uh, so let's start off with, with some history. The, uh, let's talk about the Old Testament first. So the Old Testament was written in Hebrew uh, originally. Um, later in the intertestament period, there was a Greek translation made, and that's actually the, the version of the Old Testament that the apostles were using. They quote from the Greek Old Testament 75% of the time when they're quoting it in the New Testament. That's a whole other issue. But the original Hebrew manuscripts of the Old Testament did not have chapters and verses, but rabbis eventually started adding Hebrew letters, so the letter of the Hebrew alphabet, to um, show you different lines of the text. So like in a psalm, you know, the psalms are prayers, but they're also songs. Um, so when, when they would worship, they would recite the psalms or sing the psalms. So uh, in a lot of uh, older manuscripts, you'll see where the rabbis added in, it looks like verse numbers, but it's done by letter, not number. Um, if that makes any sense. So uh, we see a little bit of that uh, in the Hebrew manuscripts, but that's later on. That's not in the original. Uh, the Greek manuscripts in the New Testament uh, also did not have chapters and verses originally. Uh, the oldest manuscripts actually have no punctuation, no paragraph divisions, and no spaces between words. So it's really fun to try to read original manuscripts. Trust me, I... I'm the nerd, I try to do that stuff, and it's hard enough to read Greek that's been separated out where it's a little more legible, but to actually read an origin, the oldest manuscripts of the New Testament, um, it's in all caps, so it's like yelling at you, you know, 
that was a social media joke. But anyway, it's in all caps, and there's no spaces between words. Um, so it's just, it looks like one giant word, <laughs> just reading down the text. So uh, I'll actually show you a picture of that uh, in a minute. So in the Bible, when, so when the apostles were writing their documents of the New Testament, there weren't any chapters and verses, there weren't separations and all these divisions that we have in our Bibles uh, today. Um, so just keep that in mind as, as we go along. So the Apostle Paul, when he's writing Galatians, he didn't write chapter 1 and then start writing his letter. He didn't do that. Somebody later put those numbers in. Make sense? Okay. You'll see why that's important in a minute. Um, around the 300s, we start, uh, we, we've discovered what's called um, lectionary text. Really, the better word is liturgical text. What these are, they're copies of books of the Bible, and you can see uh, in the text where they've made little divisions in the margin. So it's kind of like they made chapters, where they, but they didn't, they didn't put it in the text, they put it in the margin. And what they were doing is this was for the scripture readings in worship. So they would separate sections so you could find something, a, a section easier uh, that would be read during the service. So when they would gather together for worship, there'd be a scripture reading, and you would assign somebody to read this section. So they would mark it out. Make sense? So in these old Bibles, I'll show you a picture in a second, uh, you can see in the margins in between the text where they made markings. Um, so that's kind of the first we see, at least on, in the New Testament, of them trying to divide the Scripture. But they weren't doing that to change the meaning of the text or anything like that. It was just a reference tool. It was a way to find passages faster, okay? Uh, so here's uh, Codex Sinaiticus. Uh, it's named that because it was found in the uh, St. Catherine's Monastery on the traditional side of Mount Sinai. So there's a monastery there, Greek Orthodox uh, monastery, and there's a library there with all these ancient manuscripts. And uh, this is from around the 300s uh, A.D., and this is, what, this is what one of the oldest Bibles looks like. It's called a codex because that is, there's pages that are sewn together and put into a, what we call a book. That's literally a codex. Um, so if we were to zoom in, I don't know if this is going to get blurry on you, but you can see here there's not any space between words. Um, but you can see like these little markings here that you, you can't read, but that's the markings where they're saying, here's a section for a scripture reading during worship, right? Um, so that, that's kind of what it looks like, literally what it looks like. Here's another one, a three-column uh, version, and it might be a little clearer. So those are all capital letters, and there's no spaces. Now, you can see where it looks like a paragraph ends. So there, you, you can kind of see that in some manuscripts, but keep in mind, this is, you know, 300 years after these things were written. So this is a later thing. It wasn't in the original, uh, original text. Um, and I, by the way, I've got books in my office with pictures of all the ancient manuscripts uh, that we have. If you ever want to look at something like that or you want to borrow one of those, just make sure to bring it back because those books are expensive. Um, so, so in the original manuscripts, there were no divisions, no chapters, no verses. Uh, and this guy, Stephen Langton, uh, somewhere in the early 1200s, uh, he decided it would be a good idea to divide the Bible into chapters. So he didn't put verses, but he had chapters. And this was he didn't do this for any reason other than it'd be easier and faster to find things if we put it in chapters because then you'd know, okay, this passage is in chapter 6 of Galatians or whatever. Um, so it's a good thing, right? Yes, this is, these are good things. Um, now, this became uh, standardized. He was doing this with, with the uh, Latin Bible, by the way, but it actually was so effective and people liked it so much that it actually made its way into other translations as well. And the Eastern Church, the Latin Bible is being used by the Western Church, which is what we now call Roman Catholic. The Eastern Church is the uh, Eastern Orthodox. They're responsible, and just a little side note, uh, if it weren't for the Eastern Orthodox Church, we would not have many or maybe most of the Greek manuscripts of the New Testament that we have. They're the ones who are preserving and copying and protecting those texts. So thank God for the Eastern Orthodox Church. 
Now, if you go to one of their services, you think this is weird. Okay, they worship very different than we do because they're doing a very ancient form of worship. But thank God for them because they had monasteries where people copied the New Testament, the Old Testament, and protected it. Um, so, but they ended up implementing this chapter system even into these Greek texts that they had because they found that it was really effective for finding things faster, right? Uh, then you have this guy. Um, he's most of the time, if you do any research on this, everybody just calls him Stephanus. So that's what I'm going to call him because uh, I don't know how to pronounce a French last name, S-T-N-A, I don't know. Stephanus, good? Steve, we'll call him Steve, how about that? Uh, Stephanus, he's a French printer. Um, so, you know, the printing press is, is kind of cranking up at this time. Uh, so he's, he's a printer, and he wanted to produce a Bible that had not only chapters, but also verses so you could find stuff even faster by being able to find a single line in the text somewhere. Um, so he used Langton, so the previous guy we just talked about. He used his chapter divisions, and he added in these divisions of verses. Uh, and this became the standard. So what you see in your Bible today, you can thank Stephanus for that because we're still using the same system that he implemented. Um, and I think it's a great system. Okay, so just, just so you know, I'm not bashing chapters and verses in your Bible. I think they're very good. They're very helpful for me because I can find things really fast. Um, all right, l- let's talk about the downside, Okay. Uh, Some chapter and verse divisions can mislead the reader if they are unaware that there's context to this, right? So if you go find one verse and you don't know to be considering the whole context, it it can mislead you that you found that verse and it's right in the middle of this text, right? Um, So part of the reason why we do what we do on Wednesday night is I'm trying to teach you in this series more about doctrine, but I'm also trying to teach you how to read your Bible. That's really the main point of our Wednesday night gathering is I want you to know how to read your Bible on your own um, so you're not dependent on me or some internet, you know, preacher or theologian, right? You need to learn how to read your Bible. Um, So if you're unaware of the context, sometimes where they put the chapter and verse divisions can be confusing. So I'll give you just a couple, really just one example, and we'll mention one other. Uh, the, the first one we find in the Bible where the chapter stops and a new chapter begins is in a really weird pe- place is in Genesis 1-2. So the creation story, we know that story, right? There's a seven-day period in the creation story. You've got six days where he's creating spaces and organizing, creating life and filling those spaces. And then what does he do on the seventh day? He rests, right? But that's considered part of the creation week, right? Well... <laughs> For some reason, they broke that up and put the first six days in chapter 1, and the seventh day is the beginning of chapter 2. So can you see how that's kind of weird? That's an odd place to to divide the text. Um, Really, it would be better if chapter 2 began in what is, in our Bibles, chapter 2, verse 4. It starts with, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when God made the earth and the heavens, right? That's 2, 4. In the book of Genesis, the phrase, these are the generations, the Hebrew word toledo, uh, always is a transitional statement that moves to the next thing. So it's not going back and retelling something. It's saying, now here's the next part of the story. So clearly that's where chapter 2 really should start. So that's just an example. really doesn't matter. I'm just telling you that's an example of where sometimes the, where they put the numbers can confuse the context of the whole passage. Am I making any sense right now? Okay. Dessert is getting some of y'all, so I'm just making sure. Okay. (laughs) Uh, In the New Testament and really in the Old Testament too, there are places where the verse number falls in the middle of a sentence. You ever notice that? You'll look up a verse and it like begins with the word, you know, and such and such, and you're like, wait, what was before this, right? Um, So sometimes that can mess up the flow of the text. Um, sometimes a new paragraph begins in the middle of a verse. So it's like, well, is this the same thought or is the subject changing? And here's why that gets us sometimes, because we're modern English Americans, right? When we read books that have chapters in them, we assume that when you turn the page to a new chapter, it's like a new part of the story or a new subject, right? Okay, that's not how it works in the Bible. Remember, Paul didn't put chapter and verse numbers in his writings. So he... You can't, 
You can't say, well, now I'm in chapter 5. That must mean it's a whole new subject or a whole new part of it or whatever. So just be careful with that. Don't pay too much attention to the divisions. They were added later. They don't really mean anything. They're just references. Okay. So here's the principle. Chapter and verse divisions in your Bible are good for quickly finding a place in the text. They're a great thing. However, these divisions should not guide how the text is interpreted. Now, let me give you one example in case you're wondering who in the world is paying that much attention to the verse numbers. Well, people who are really big into biblical numerology, I don't know if you've ever heard of these things. Have you ever heard of, like, the Bible code? No, you had not because you're not a Bible nerd like me. But sometimes you'll see this on the History Channel. There's, like, this Bible code that, you know, some secret code under the text or whatever. Um, there are other people who put a lot of weight into, like, symbolic meanings behind numbers in the Bible. And that is a thing, like the number seven means completion or whatever, uh, that kind of thing. Um, but you can take that too far. Like I know some people, they're really not popular. Actually, most of them are probably dead by now. Um, but I've heard some evangelists or revival type preachers will actually say, well, the number five represents the concept of grace in the Bible. So anytime you're in a chapter five or in a verse five, you should be looking for grace in that verse because it's got to be there. It's like, I think you're taking this a little too far. <laughs> and it, that kind of thinking denies the facts, which is these numbers weren't in there originally. So you can't t- put too much weight on it. Am, am I making sense? So the whole numerology thing, the Bible code thing, it's, it's a hoax. It, there's nothing to it. Um, trust me, I know some legit Hebrew Bible scholars and they will tell you the Bible code, Bible code idea is hogwash. Uh, because what do you do when you have different manuscripts and the numbers don't add up? Kind of messes your whole code up, doesn't it? So um, anyway, so I don't think anybody in here is like playing around with biblical numerology, but I just want to make you aware in case you see it on TikTok or something, somebody doing some kind of Bible code, you can just swipe on through that one. I don't have TikTok, but do you swipe? Is that how you... Up? Is it up? Oh, right or left is a dating app thing, probably. Yeah. Anyway, let's just move right on. Uh, so here's some passages. Uh, these are popular verses that, uh, that get taken out of context a lot. And this was really hard for me to do because there's so many that I could include. Um, so I'm just going to pick out a few of them. And this might actually take us a while, even though I only picked a few. Um, But what I want to do is show you how we take it out of context, or at least in the popular Christian world, how it gets taken out of context. And then I want to teach you how to read that passage in context. That makes sense? Okay. All right. So here we go. We start in Genesis 3. This is God talking to Eve, which in chapter 3 at this point, she's just called the woman. She's not been named yet. Uh, So this is after they've disobeyed and eaten of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Y'all remember the story, right? And then this line comes in in Genesis 3.16. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband. Literally, your desire will be against your husband. But he shall rule over you. (laughs) Okay, that amen is exactly why we need to talk about this. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> That's awesome. We needed that. Thanks, Blake. <laughs> so here's, here's how to read this out of context. Okay, if you just pull that line out of the text and you're thinking that the Bible is a divine reference book where every word in it is a direct command of God, okay, then that makes this verse, this means God is saying that husbands must rule over their wives. Now, the word for rule here is the word dominate. It means literally rule over. So, if you take this out of context, you can make it, you can twist it and make it say, husbands are to rule over their wives. Okay? But now, let's just, let's first use logic and then we're going to make a biblical argument with context. Okay? Here's the logical outcome of that. Because, and here's why I'm bringing this one up. I have literally heard people preachers, pastors, popular theologians who write books that people buy who argue that this verse means husbands must rule over their wives. Their wives should not have any deciding factors in their marriage. 
the husband is in charge, he's the ruler. I've heard that argument, literally, all right? I'm not exaggerating. Okay, now let's take that argument to its logical conclusion. If this is a command of God, that this is what God wants, then doesn't it also follow that he wants your wife to be against you? It's right there. Your desire is to be against your husband, but he's going to rule over you. Now, if you've ever read this whole passage, you know this is not God saying what he wants for humanity. He is telling Adam and Eve the consequences of what they've just done. Right? They sinned, and he's telling them, now here's what's going to happen. You've brought sin into your life. You're going to continue to do this. It's going to, you're going to allow it to rule you. And here's what's going to happen. Y'all are going to be at odds with each other. When sin is in a relationship, you're going to have conflict. Amen? Amen, Blake? Yes, amen. Okay. <laughs> so this, this is what's going on. If you take this out of context, you can make it sound like God is saying this is what he wants. But that's not what the context is saying. If you read the whole passage, he's simply telling them, because you have done this, that's the literal line in the text, because you have done this, and then he lays out, here's what's going to happen now. Here's what's going to happen in your life. You're going to have relationship struggles. You're going to have desires that are contrary to your husband's desires. Is this, is this true? Yes. Is it, is it a wonderful thing in our lives that we fight with each other? Not exactly. <laughs> That's not what God wants. But apparently it's what we want because we keep bringing it into our lives. Right? So this is not a command of God that this is how he wants things. He's simply telling them, this is what's going to happen now because you've brought sin into your relationship. You're going to be at odds with each other. And you're going you're gonna to realize that in this world, men are going to rule over women. Yeah. What's that? Yeah. So this, this is what God is saying to them as a result of their sin. All right? So you have to be careful, right? You have to be careful how you read these texts. You pull one verse out, you better read what's around it. Uh, here's another one. This one's really popular. It gets put on T-shirts and coffee mugs and pretty pictures. and uh, It's on Facebook a lot. For I know the plans I have for you, that's important, the word you is important, declares the Lord, plans for welfare, and, and that's not welfare like checks from the government, welfare. Just, you have to clarify these things now. Uh, plans for um, well-doing and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. It's Jeremiah 29, 11. It's one of the most popular verses quoted today. Now, I will say this. In some sense, that is true for us, right? God does have a plan for you. He does have a future for you, unless you're going to be dead tonight. You've got a future, <laughs> right? There is a hope. If you're faithful to God, you've got all kinds of hope, right? So these things are true. The question is, who is you in this passage? And this is something you always want to ask yourself when you're reading the Bible and you see the word you. You always need to ask, who is that? Who is you? Because here's what we do as modern, especially in modern American Christians. When we see you in the Bible, well, that's talking about me. Do you know why we think that? Because we think we're the center of the universe in America, right? We're self-centered. That's our culture, right? So when we read the word you, we automatically think, well, that's me. Here I am, right here in the Bible, right? But let's check the context. If you go read the whole context of Jeremiah 29, you will not want to claim this verse anymore. Here's why. Verse 10, we'll just go one verse in front of it. All right? Just one. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you, I will fulfill to you my promise, and bring you back to this place. Now, what do you think is going on here? Israel is being exiled to Babylon for being idolatrous and disobedient and rebellious. God's own people are going to be conquered by Babylon and taken captive to Babylon. Right? This is how Daniel gets in Babylon. Right? 
and they're going to be there for 70 years. Now, later in the book of Daniel, Daniel is reading this passage and asking God, hey, seven, it's like coming up on 70 years. Doesn't look like we're going back to the promised land. And God sends an angel to Daniel to say, yeah, well, the 70 is now going to be 490 years. Ooh, right? Now, they did go back to the land, and they did repair everything. Ezra, Nehemiah, read that the whole story there. Uh, but God never comes back and dwells in the temple, right? So what's the context of this passage? The context is we're headed into exile for 70 years, but God has plans for you. So do you still want to claim verse 11? Because if you do, you have to also claim verse 10. So let's read it into our culture. Everybody loves to do that nowadays. We like to read America into the Bible, right? So let's do that. We're going to be taking captive 70 years to Mexico. I don't know. Pick a country, right? China. There we go. That's, That's on the radar, right? We're going to be in captivity for 70 years in China. But I know the plans I have for you. That changes things, doesn't it? So who is you in this passage? It's ancient Israel. It's not you. So be careful pulling a verse and claiming it for you when you're not the you in the you (laughs) in this passage. Okay? Now, like I said, the principle behind the verse is still true for us, that God does have plans for us. He does want to do good things for us. He does want to give us a hope and a future. That's true. But I'm just telling you, don't pull verse 11 without claiming verse 10 because that's pulling out of context. And if you go back, he actually tells you at the beginning of this chapter that he's speaking to the exiles who are in Babylon, right? Uh, Matthew chapter 7, this is probably the most famous one. Judge not that you be not judged, right? So if we just take that verse and we don't read anything else, Jesus is saying Christians should not judge anyone for any reason at any time. Isn't that how it's interpreted nowadays? I mean, if you, if you want to see this, okay, look, you've got all kinds of friends who are like wicked sinners. They got this verse memorized. You want to know how to find out? Tell them they're doing something wrong. And they'll quickly quote this verse. Now, if you want to have a lot of fun, ask them where that verse is. They don't know. (laughs) Well, Jesus says it's in the red words, right? They don't know. They don't know where it's at. But they know that verse. You know, there's two verses everybody in America knows. You know, judge not and Jesus wept. Because that's the shortest one. It's easy to memorize, right? Now, what does Jesus actually say? Well, this is verse 1. There's more verses after it. Right? This is in the Sermon on the Mount. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure or the standard you use, it will be measured to you. So the tape measure you're using to measure people up, that's the one that's going to be used on you. So the point here is not don't judge at all. It's be careful how you judge and what standard you're using. Let's read on. Why do you see the speck, literally sawdust, that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the tree? The word here is for a huge beam. Okay, so you notice, you're, you're pointing out sawdust while you have a tree sticking out of your face. That's the picture here. Jesus is hilarious. A lot of times we read this and we don't think he's being, he's being hilarious right here. I would have laughed. If I would have been saying it, I'd be like, oh, that's good. That's a good illustration, right? You don't notice the log that is in your own eye. Or how can you, look, this even gets funnier. How can you say to your brother, hey, let me, let me help you out with that sawdust. Why, you got a tree sticking out of your face. How, how can you, literally, how can you help them with their sawdust? You can't get close enough to them. The tree's going to knock them out. That's it, sticking out of your face, right? So he says, <laughs> And, you know, nice, humble, hippie-hugging Jesus says, you hypocrite, that's not American Jesus, is it? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye and then 
you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So if you read verse 1, and then you read verse 5, you find out judge not doesn't mean don't judge anybody anywhere, anytime. It means, because he goes on to explain, be careful how you judge others. Deal with your own stuff so that you can help with someone else's stuff. Make sense? And look, you didn't need, you didn't need a uh, class in Greek to figure this out. You just needed to read four more verses. Context is everything, right? So in context, Christians must judge righteously and with humility. Deal with your own stuff. Use the right standard. Don't judge based on preferences or whatever. We judge by the word of God. Yes? So it is, it is biblical. It is biblically commanded that Christians judge one another. But we must do it with humility, and we must do it according to Scripture. Make sense? Okay. We're called to do that. You're called to do it to me. I'm called to do it to you. You're called to do it to each other. So I'm giving you permission to judge one another how Jesus said to do it. Okay? And if we do that, we'll all be better. If nobody does that, we'll all be worse. Okay, we'll move on. Uh, Matthew 24. I really debated about talking about this because we've talked about it a lot already. Uh, we actually have a whole series uh, on our YouTube channel and our app called The End of the Age, which is a long, like, four-week study of uh, Matthew chapter 24. So this often gets read out of its context, okay? So there's, there's statements in this chapter that we've kind of turned into the end of the world, right? So the, it mentions the signs of the end of the age, um, now, one reason why we think this is about the end of the world is because the King James Version translates the word for age as world. So in the King James Version, it says the signs of the end of the world. The problem with that is the Greek text does not say cosmos, which is world. It says aeon or aeonos, which is the word for age, not the whole world. Uh, what's the end of this age of time? Okay. Uh, he, Jesus tells them, many will come saying, I am the Christ. So they're false Christ, they're anti-Christ, right? Uh, wars and rumors of wars, abomination of def- desolation, nation will rise against nation, there will be great tribulation. Now, if you take this out of context, you think that he is talking about the end of the world. In the first 35 verses, he's not. The following passage, he starts talking about the end but not in 1 through 35. In that, he's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. I'll prove it to you. Verse 1, which is the start of that whole conversation. Most people, when they're talking Matthew 24, they skip this whole part I'm about to read to you. That's why I get confused. Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. So what might be the subject of this conversation? The temple. (laughs) But he answered them, you see, you see, who's you? The disciples, not you, (laughs) them. (laughs) You see all these things, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone left upon another. It's coming down. Um, And he sat on the Mount of, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, so that's, That's a hill right outside of the temple uh, complex, and it actually has a perfect view of the temple mount on the Mount of Olives. Beautiful view. Um, They're there. The disciples came to him privately. So it's not a huge crowd. This is the disciples, right? If you read the other Gospels, they tell you exactly which disciples were there. And they said, okay, tell us, when will these things be? What things? What he just said, the temple's coming down. So they ask, well, when's that going to happen? When is the temple coming down? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So they got a loaded question, don't they? Okay, everything he's going to say after this, for the next 30 verses, he's going to be explaining the signs that the temple's about to be destroyed and Jerusalem's going to be destroyed. 
Matter of fact, if you read Luke's account, it's in Luke 21. This, this passage, this story is in uh, Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. Okay? Luke is writing to Gentiles, so he clears up some stuff for us. Uh, Matthew's writing to Jews. Luke says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, get out of town. Flee to the mountains, right? Um, so what's going on here in the first 35 verses is he's telling them about the time when the temple would be destroyed, which happened in A.D. 70. It was surrounded by the Romans. The Jews had almost destroyed it before the Romans got there. Um, but they all were infighting and all that stuff. You can go watch our series, End of the Age, you'll learn way more about this. I'm just teaching you, when you read passages and you think, well, that sounds like the end of the world, you might want to go read the whole context. It may not be about the end of the world at all. It may be about the end of a specific time. <laughs> so, uh, now, if you keep reading, he says this, and this is at the end. This is uh, verse 34, actually. He gives you all these things that are going to happen, and he literally says, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. So everything he mentioned before that, he said that's going to happen before this generation passes away. Now, pe there's people you know, much later in church history that think this generation is talking about some future generation in our future. Um, that's not how anybody standing there understood what Jesus was saying. They understood him to say our generation, right? So you've got to read in context. Now, Paul's right here bunch of people argue about what everything I just said, okay? If you're listening right now and you're like, I don't know if I buy that, well, go study it on your own. That's cool, all right? And we can disagree with that and still be in fellowship. It's all right. Uh, just make sure you're reading the Bible in context. Don't, don't go listen to somebody on YouTube and then let them tell you what the Bible says. Read it yourself, all right? Uh, here's another popular one, really popular in the sports world. Uh, I've also seen uh, Christian music. I'm gonna pick on myself too. I've seen Christian musicians have this tattooed on them, and like they can do all things, you know. So, Philippians four thirteen. I'm not picking on my brother-in-law. I just remember. I just remembered he has this tattooed. I don't. Don't worry. Don't get nervous. All right. I'm just gonna give you context for what's on your arm. All right. It's all right. It's totally fine to have this tattooed. Okay. Just make sure you know what this verse means and what it doesn't mean, okay? Because what it often means is we can just do whatever we want. I can do all things through him, the him there is Christ, who strengthens me. This is Paul writing, right? Now taken out of context and taken like too literal, it would be that Christians can do all things because you got Jesus, right? Right? So in the sports world, as they claim this verse, I can score this touchdown. As if Jesus is just dying for you to make a touchdown, right? Or musicians may use it to think I'm going to, you know, play this show awesome in front of everybody, as if that's, that really matters, right? So be careful when you claim this verse, because if you read the verses right before it, you might not want to claim this one, okay? Um, here's some problems. With, with this idea that we can do all things, literally, okay? Christians are also told in Paul's letters not to do many things, right? There's quite a few things. Paul gives a long list of things that you can't do as a Christian. You are not to do them. So you clearly can't do all things. I mean, you, you can. That doesn't mean you should, Right? So I think we're all on the same page on that one. But the context actually explains what things Paul is talking about. So let's read the context, okay? He says, not that I'm speaking of being in need, because he's talking about that subject a few verses before this. He says, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. This passage is about being content, right? Not going and getting more which is what this verse usually gets made into, right? I can do all things, which means I can win the lottery. Or I can do all things, which means I can start and make a successful business. Well, maybe you can, maybe you can't, right? So we, we often take this and we make it a greedy thing, and Paul is talking about the opposite. He's saying, I've learned that in whatever situation, I'm supposed to be content. He says, I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. 
In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, two extremes, abundance and need. I can do all those things through him who gives me strength. So what kind of things are we talking about? Well, we're talking about in whatever situation you end up in, if you're following Christ, you can handle it because he's with you. Now, if you go read Paul's story, you'll find out he had some really hard times, right? So for, for Paul to say, I can do all things through him who gives me strength, it really means something different than if a TV preacher who's a millionaire says it. They have very different lives, right? Paul was shipwrecked multiple times on a mission trip. Can you imagine? He actually shipwrecked and floated in the ocean and washed up on an island. He gets off on the island, gets bit by a viper. Now, at that point, I think I'd be throwing my hands up to heaven and going, really? I'm on a mission trip for you, and you let my boat sink, and now I get bit by a snake, right? But then if you keep reading, nope, the, snake, the venom has no effect on Paul, and everybody on the island thinks he's a god. And he goes, nope, I'm not a god, but I can introduce you to him. And they become Christians, right? Paul had a tough life. That's the story behind this verse. I made him mad and he's leaving. I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. They got to pick up kids. So the all things, he's saying I can handle whatever gets thrown at me because Christ is with me. That's the key. It's not because Paul's awesome. It's because Jesus in Paul is awesome. You can handle these things. Now, this is uh, very relevant for our time today. I've been telling you, and I'm, I'm not being doom and gloom, and I'm not a prophet, but, I mean, I can kind of see the signs. This next year is going to be crazy. Before we claim I can do all things, we might want to pay attention to what things we're talking about. And here's what I want to say to you. Like I said, I'm not a prophet. This is not thus says the Lord. But I will tell you this. If we will do what we've been talking about around here for years, taking care of each other, staying faithful to Jesus, not just believing in him but being faithful to him, if we stick to that and we stick to thinking that each of us are, are, are each other's brothers and sisters and we're responsible for each other, if we will stick to that, we can handle all things that's going to be thrown at us this next year. We just got to be like Paul. But don't take this verse and think, well, this means I can get more of what America says I need, like possessions and wealth. I can't find any place where Jesus preached the prosperity gospel, which is pray more and God will give you more money. I can find a lot of places where Jesus said, greed is your problem. I can find a lot of places where he says, money is your problem. You love money too much. Remember the rich guy, the rich young ruler? I want to follow you. What do I need to do to inherit eternal life? Oh, nothing big. Just give away everything and come follow me. And the guy couldn't do it. He loved his stuff, right? This verse is not about getting more stuff. It's about You can handle hardship, and you can handle having plenty if you're faithful to Jesus. Make sense? So in context, Christians can be content in all circumstances. We're going to get tried on that one this year, maybe within two years, but we're going to have some trials where our faith is going to be tested. Our faithfulness is going to be tested. The last pandemic we had, we found out who, how many people who were going to church really thought church was valuable. Because when we finally could actually go back to church, a bunch of people never came back. What happened? Their faith was tested. They found out it's a lot more convenient to have Sundays off. Stay at home. So that's what a lot of people are still doing today, right? We're going to have hard times come up. 
if we take care of each other and do what God's called us to do, we will be okay. Now, you, you might have less than you used to. If God came to you tonight, I didn't plan on saying all this. If God showed up in your bedroom tonight, first you'd have to change the sheets, but let's just say he did. Okay, if he shows up in your bedroom and he lays out the next year and he lays out some pretty awful events and he says, you are going to have less from now on. You're going to have to get rid of some things. You're going to lose some things you really love but really don't matter. And you're going to have less from here on out. Would you still stay faithful to him? Because your first question, our American prayer would be, please don't let that happen. Right? Can we just all be honest with each other? God, please don't let me have less. I don't want to live on less. Right? But what if God said, that's best for you and that's your life from now on? Would you still be faithful to him? That's what Paul's getting at. Got tents in here. Lighten up. (laughs) Hebrews 11. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Now, you, you can probably already guess this one. When you read the word faith in your Bible, you're supposed to think faithfulness, right? Not just believing something, but a lot of people pull this out and say, here's the definition of faith. It's about belief, right? It's about hoping for something. Or it's about having a really, you know, good confidence in things you can't see. Well, if you pull that verse out of its context and you don't read what else he says, you would come up with that idea. Well, faith, you know, faith means believing stuff. So see, right here, it means believing stuff. But if you keep reading, the author gives you examples of what he means by faith. He actually says, by faith, so and so. And then he tells you what they did, not what they believed. You ever read Hebrews 11? If you pay attention, I've read that my whole life. And I always thought it was about, well, these people believed so good. Because it's the hall of faith, right? Hebrews 11. But when you start really paying attention to what the author actually says, he's telling you what faith is by action. Um, Just some examples. I had some in your notes, I think, but I've lost my place in my notes. Well, here it is. He goes on to say things like this. By faith, Abel offered a sacrifice. He did something, right? Then his brother killed him, but that's beside the point, (laughs) right? He did something. He did something that proved his belief, his faith, right? Enoch pleased God. Apparently so well, he just got to skip out on this whole sinful world thing, and he was just taken, right? A whole other story. We don't have time. Noah, by faith, Noah built an ark. Now, what if Noah had just stood around going, I believe? Noah, it's going to rain. I believe you. I believe you, God. I've got strong faith. Right? Noah, it, it's going to rain like a lot. You need to build a boat. I'm going to restart the whole thing with you. We need to build a boat. I believe. What if he had never built the ark? We wouldn't be here right now because there wouldn't be anybody left unless God started over and recreated everything, right? So, It wasn't about what he believed. It's about what he did. He did what he said he believed, right? Uh, Abraham obeyed by leaving his homeland. Abraham obeyed by offering Isaac. When God comes to him and says, I want you to go up on top of the mountain and offer your son as a sacrifice. Now, that's a weird request. But Abraham's not commended for sitting in his tent saying, I believe. He got Isaac and went up the mountain. And his faith was proven by his actions. So don't pull this out and say, there's the definition of faith. No, the whole chapter is the definition of faith. Because everything after this verse explains what he means by this. Right? It's about faithfulness. Okay. What time is it? 726. Good. Doing great. How to read the Bible in context. I'm going to teach you how to read your Bible. You good? Still awake? All right. This is really short because it's really simple. All right? You need to learn to ask the right questions when you're reading the Bible. Now, you may have grown up in a church where they didn't let you ask any questions. Ever happened to you? 
most of the time in the churches I went to, I was allowed to ask questions. Now, sometimes I asked questions they didn't want me to ask, and they made it very clear. Okay, no more questions from you, right? You know, when you're asking, we're, we're reading in Genesis, and I'm asking about dinosaurs, and they're just like, I don't know what to do with you. Shut up, right? Um, so you need to learn to ask good questions when you're reading the Bible. It's okay. Questions are good. Yes? Okay. So here's some questions you need to ask. When you're reading your Bible, you need to ask these questions. Who wrote this, first of all? And who was it written to? Because Americans read the Bible and we think this is all written to me. Well, you didn't live 2,000 years ago. It clearly wasn't written directly to you. You weren't here yet, right? It's written for you, not directly to you. It's written to them, but it's for us. Make sense? That's a really important principle. So who wrote it? Who's it written to? Because that matters. Um, what is going on with these people that they're writing to? What was going on in history at the time? Now, you might be thinking, how in the world am I going to find all this information? Well, you can get really good study Bibles that help you with a lot of this. Now, be careful with study Bibles because sometimes they're wrong, okay? But usually on background information, like in a book introduction, so let's say you want to read Hebrews, you get in a study Bible, they usually have an introduction that'll tell you who wrote it, when was it written, and all that kind of, well, they won't tell you on Hebrews because they all think they don't know who wrote it. It was Paul. But anyway, he didn't write it. Luke wrote it, but it's a sermon from Paul. Another night, okay? Um, but in a study Bible, it will usually tell you these things. It will tell you what's going on in the church that they're writing to. It just helps you get the context. Make sense? So who's it? who wrote it? Who's it written to? What was going on? When was it written? So is this, you know, this right around the time of Jesus, right after Jesus? When was it? Uh, where was it written to? Where, where is this happening at? That's important, Okay. That's all context, okay? And then ask the question, why does this matter? So you read something in your Bible. That, that ought to be the easy one. Anytime you're reading your Bible, you're thinking, well, what does this have to do with me, right? Why does this matter for me today? Um, so those are good questions to ask. With any verse you read, and by the way, here's a principle. I think there's a guy named Greg Kokel. He's a popular Christian teacher. I think it's him that, that says this all the time. Um, Never read a Bible verse. Never read a Bible verse. Always read the context. Right? So that's what you want to know. What came before this verse I'm reading and what came after it? Because usually what comes before it gives you the background of that verse and what comes after it might explain that verse. And if you miss all of that, you take it out of context. Right? Okay. So I hope that helps you. Uh, a little bit in reading your Bible, help you think about it. If nothing else, I just want you to be mindful that there's always context. Don't read stuff out of context, right? Especially if, if you're reading Paul's letters. They're not theological treatises. That's not what they are. They're letters written to real people, churches in the first century, right? So you need to pay attention to the context or you'll really misunderstand it, okay? We talked about this a little bit last week with the spiritual gifts passage in 1 Corinthians. If you don't know how crazy Corinth was and that church in Corinth, if you don't have that backstory, you will miss what's really going on there. You'll, you'll miss what Paul's really trying to do. Um, so that's why all of that's important. Okay, next week, I think we're going to talk about denominations next week. Unless God changes something or Jesus comes back, come quickly, Lord Jesus, that'd be great. Um, but if, if he doesn't, uh, we'll probably be talking about denominations. Why are there denominations? Where do some of the major ones come from? When did they start? That kind of thing. Now, you might not care at all about that. You might be thinking, I don't care about denominations. But it is an interesting thing to know. Uh, maybe you were raised in the Baptist church. Well, where do they originate from? And Maybe you were Methodist or Presbyterian or, or whatever, you know, um, where did they come from? Where did some of these other groups like Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons and that kind of thing, where did, where did that start? So we're going to kind of talk about that, and then I'm going to try to share, in case you're wondering, like, are we going to read the Bible at all? <laughs> we are. The point of why we need to talk about this is the concept of unity. Why is it important for the church to be unified? And when is it okay to not be unified with a group of 
Christians. Okay, so we're going to talk about that. So it is we are going to dig into some scripture, and I'll kind of tell you a little bit of history of the denominations. We won't dig too deep into that, um, but I want you to be aware of why we're so divided, and then I want to kind of give you a picture of how we might get more united. Because as the times get harder, we better figure out how to work together. Amen? Yeah. So that's what we'll cover next week.